today I'm going to talk about quantifiers as adjoints, a, uh, a nice topic that I guess our group has come to uh, come to enjoy recently. Um, and I also talked about this at the GSS talk uh, a while ago. Um, so it's possible that that everybody here has already heard at least the beginning of this, but uh, hopefully we'll go a little a little farther this time. So uh, so yeah, the simplest way to start this is just by talking about propositional logic. And um, and you start with the fact that propositions uh, relate by implications uh, to form pre-orders. Um, so if you just had some collection of propositions about some topic, the natural structure that you would want to put on them is, is by implication. And then this forms a, uh, a pre-order, which is a, a transitive and reflexive relation. And you can think about this as a, as a zero category. Um, because you can think of transitivity as being a uh, degenerate form of composition and reflexivity as being a degenerate form of identity. And uh, like I was trying to do in the GSS talk, I was motivating um, this topic by saying that the logical operations of AND and OR are not arbitrary binary operations that you can do on, uh, on propositions. Uh, they're, they're canonical um, in some way because they're intertwined with this structure of implication. So uh, for the operation of OR, the formal way to say this, uh, this connection is that disjunction is left adjoint to duplication. So what this means is that uh, if you have that A or B implies Z, this is equivalent to A implies Z and B implies Z. Uh, and the way to think about this is that if you have some reasoning that uh, proceeds from um, some disjunction of hypotheses, so you can give in that this is the case, or this is the case, or this is the case, then blah, 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 then that means that uh, you had a plan for all of those cases. Um, you know, if, if, uh, if you give me white sugar or brown sugar, then I know how to make a cake. Then I have a plan for, if you give me white sugar, I know how to make a cake. And, and if you give me brown sugar, I know how to, make a cake. Um, Can I interrupt for one yeah. second? Yeah, please. And, and everyone else should also yeah. be probably in trouble more, more freely than me. Um, I just wanted to warn people that the, that the angle underneath that vertical, uh, that horizontal bar is a, like a completely different flavor of thing than the or symbol above. And I would have written it like in plain English or something, because the or symbol you're, that you're defining by this uh, yeah. formula here is going to be a thing that given two elements of your pre-order gives you another element of your pre-order. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a binary operation, whereas the and is not that at all. Yeah. Um, it's just an English and saying that A is less than or equal to Z, which is another way to read this implies and b is less than or equal to z yeah yeah it's gonna be answer. very confusing to people who are starting out in logic because you're using as always you're using logic to reason about logic yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah so uh so just read this bottom one as a plain old and um but yeah, so, so at first it might be a little bit weird that this flips from an or to, to an and, but, um, but is everybody okay with this? Are there any questions? 
So yeah. Certainly if, if the yeah. top is true, the bottom, even as written as with, with the same kind of and should also be true. Yeah, it's just like. No, the bottom one doesn't even make sense. As it's, taking, <laughs> it's taking for granted that prop is closed, which is probably something we shouldn't worry about. Yeah, I mean, this implies, <laughs> it, I mean, currently the bottom thing doesn't make any sense at all because, because A, well, it doesn't make any sense the and is being of the same sort as the or, that's what I mean. Because this thing A implies Z is not another proposition in your, in your pre-order. It's a statement about your pre-order saying that A is less than or equal to, to Z. Oh, okay. So you're not ta talking about the hiding algebra here. You're, you're just talking about the pre-order and <laughs> yeah. implication. We should read something like entailment. Yeah, I should have, so, I should have used less than or equal to. Yeah. That's one way to, yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, you one needs to disentangle the, uh, the terminology that you're using to talk about the pre-order, which is going to involve yeah. plain old fashioned logic <laughs> and the operations in your pre-order. And then this implication thingy right now, it's a binary relation on the set. It's yeah. not a, just a relation. you may later on get. So I think, I think the way it would usually be presented with inference rules is that A or B entails Z or from A or B entails Z, you can derive that A entails Z. And then they repeat the inference rule from A or B entails Z, you can derive that B entails Z as a separate inference rule. But yeah. also, Christian wants to be able to derive the top one from the bottom. Yeah, I'm using I'm using the horizontal line to mean equivalent in this in this case. Okay, so I've often seen a double line where it's invertible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, so everybody, uh, please read this as uh, you know A or B entails. So um, however you want to write that, less than or equal to uh, double line or if and only if. Uh, a entails Z English and B entails Z. All right. Um, so as we know, this is uh, secretly talking about an adjunction. So there we can imagine that we're living in some uh, pre-order of propositions about something. We can think about this as a simple kind of category. Uh, where uh, instead of hum sets, we just have hum truth values, uh, whether two things are related or not. And there is a canonical functor from prop to prop squared that just duplicates propositions. And that's this ZZ here. Um, and the thing that is special about OR is that it's left adjoint to that duplication functor. And so this, this logical equivalence here can be rewritten in terms of some, uh, some natural bijection of Homs um, that this implication is true if and only if uh, this pair of implications is true. Any questions about that? So um, if anybody is not comfortable with adjoints yet, um, that's fine and just, uh, just ask questions. The basic idea is that going out of a left adjoint is equivalent to going into the right adjoint and you always get some nice relationship like this. So similarly, Conjunction is the is right adjoint to that functor. So um, so if we have z entails a and z entails b, this is equivalent to z entails a and b. This one is probably slightly more intuitive because you're basically just like collecting up the conclusions of some reasoning. Um, if uh, I have 
if having sugar means that I can make a cake and having sugar means that I can make a donut, then having sugar means I can make a cake and a donut. That's not actually true. Uh, you, ha, you shouldn't, that's a different kind of, right? I mean, it's like, if having money means I can marry one woman, Jill, and having money means I can marry Jane, therefore having money means I can marry Jill and Jane, uh, doesn't, doesn't work, right? Yeah, yeah. We could just say it is possible to make the cake and it is possible to... Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. That's, a, that, that's a linear logic. I, I was joking yeah. because that would be a linear logic and where you being able to do something and being able to do something else means that you're able to do both of them yeah. at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm just causing trouble here, but there's so many <laughs> subtleties here. I thought I'd just like expose them yeah no it's fine um yeah so so this is the same idea if you have some reasoning that concludes in a conjunction that's equivalent to um to having these reasonings where you get each of those conclusions um so here we get a similar equivalence, but now it's going the other way. Um, we have that going out of a duplicated proposition, uh, a pair of entailments in, in prop squared is equivalent to uh, that proposition entailing the conjunction. Now, there's the obvious um, reading of or is plus and and is times and implies is exponentiation, mm -hmm. right? That z to the a plus b equals z to the a times z to the b, mm -hmm. and a b to the z is a to the z b to the z. Um, is there a similar adjunction there, or is that a decategorification? Or yeah, yeah. So one way of saying this is that this is a decategorification of the universal property of co-product and product. Um, this is the pre-order version of, of those universal properties. Um, so all the same stuff applies, including the relationship with, with exponent. But what we're going to talk about now is a is kind of a different direction generalization. Um, in terms of indexing. So um, it's interesting how there's one, there are certain like, like really clear generalizations of a certain phenomenon, but then there can sometimes be a slightly orthogonal generalization. Any other questions? So, uh, so this, this fact can be generalized to predicate logic. So a predicate uh, is basically a proposition with a hole in it, or possibly multiple holes. Uh, you can think about it as a function from a set to the set of truth values uh, that, uh, that evaluate some things to true and some things to false. And uh, implicitly, now we're gonna be understanding predicates as equivalent to like the subset of things that make them true. So the generalization that we're going to talk about is that um, is that we use indexed or an and all the time in math, uh, except we call them there exists and for all. So the intuition is that when you say there exists, it's just a big or. Um, when you say there exists, a natural number such that blah, 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 uh, that blah, blah, blah is some predicate on natural numbers. And uh, well, not necessarily, it's some, it's some predicate that involves a natural number. And uh, what you're doing when you say there exists is that uh, you're plugging in every possible natural number that you could uh, into the variable, and you're oring all of them. Uh, and similarly for for all. Um, 
So, so let's say, um, let's say we have two predicates. Um, so P uh, is a predicate on sets A and B. Uh, it's a predicate in two variables. So you can think this is just uh, some proposition with two variables like A plus B equals three or something. And so it will evaluate to true for all the pairs uh, that evaluate, uh, that, that make that equality true and false otherwise. And similarly, Q is some uh, predicate in one variable. So, uh, so we're going to get a, a similar equivalence, but but before we get to this, I just want to draw out what's going on. Oh, sorry. Could you approve my other account for screen sharing? Because I'm going to use a word. Uh, I approved every one for screen sharing. I think. Um, Let's see. Uh, oh, okay. I approve that anyone more than one person can share at once. Uh, I can do it so that. Okay, I got it. Just... Okay. So, um, so we have two predicates. One of them is is uh, depends on A and B, and one of them just depends on A. And we're thinking about uh, ways that we can turn one of them into the other, uh, into the form of the other. So there's a clear map between A and B, which is projection, just projection onto the A component. And there is a term in logic called weakening, where given this, uh, this predicate Q, we could make it a predicate on both variables by just making it vacuously depend on the variable B. Um, so you can define uh, Q star A B to be whatever the predicate Q was and B equals B. Why did you put a bracket around the I had just just a notation that it's like not really depending on it. Okay. But okay, I like this better. <laughs> um, yeah, so you choose, whoops. You choose some, uh, you choose kind of the vacuous proposition that's going to be true for all B. And uh, just Why do you need that vacuous proposition in there? Why can't you just say equals Q of A? Um, yeah, I guess, I guess you can. Um, you can, yeah, you can. Yeah. You, this is just to reassure the reader that it depends on B. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just okay. Sure. Yeah, I guess it's the. In computer science, you can have functions with any number of parameters and you don't have to use any of them. But I guess in math, they're a little more hesitant to do that. Well, it's mainly just to comfort people. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's just to comfort people. I had the opposite effect, apparently. <laughs> it's, it's a psychological. Yeah, so there's two ways of describing this uh, process. So we could think of Q star as uh, Q pi. So if you think about precomposing by pi, then its value on a b is just uh, is just q's value on a, right? Because because pi throws away the b. So q star is q pi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, but if people are more comfortable thinking about subsets, uh, there is. So for any predicate, we can also think of it as the subset of the things that makes it true. Maybe a tilde over it. And uh, that precomposition also corresponds to taking the pullback along pi. And here, <coughs> here 
here you would get uh, Q times B. Um, so if you're not if you're not comfortable with pullback yet, it's just like uh, like an indexed version of product, sort of. Uh, it's also called the fibered product. So here, uh, what it's doing is um, you could say that it's forming cylinders. Uh, so the definition of the pullback is uh, the set of all well, I, I don't want to make this seem more complicated than it is. Essentially, uh, for each element in Q, uh, you're now taking it to all possible pairs. Uh, such, that B is, such that B is in B. That's all this is doing. Uh, people call this forming cylinders because of a, some way that it looks when you graph it. So anyway, um, there's two ways of viewing this, this term called weakening in logic. Um, and we can see that this is kind of like a diagonal, uh, or sorry, like a duplication, like we were talking about before, because now we're getting uh, a copy of u a copy of each element for every element of B. Um, so, so this can be seen as a generalization of the duplication that we were talking about. Any questions? So now we're talking about left and right adjoints to this um, weakening, which can be seen as a generalization of the duplication. I have one question that maybe you may want to answer later or something, but yep. um, so the pullback is a limit. So it's an adjoint two. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if I don't want to derail things any more than I already am, but I was wondering if you were, I hadn't thought about this pullback very much. I was wondering if you're going to try to bring that, that, pull back into this adjoint story that you're telling um, that like it's an adjoint to something. Yeah. Uh, I, I wasn't planning on it, but you know, there's, there's some nice story there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Never mind. This one. Okay. So, so now we're talking about uh, the left and right adjoints of, of that weakening. So what we normally call existential quantification, just in everyday math, is precisely the left adjoint to this weakening. And here we have, um, we have an equivalence uh, of implications that generalizes what we were just talking about with disjunction. So, uh, so there exists B uh, so uh, let's see how should I say this um, so in that in that picture um, when we were pulling back along uh, pi to take something that was sitting over A, a subset of A, and turn it into a subset of A times B. Now what we're doing to go the other way is we take some subset of uh, A times B, this, this P, and we're really just composing with that pi. We're, we're taking that subset and just composing with with pi to get something sitting over a. And that, that turns out to be the left adjoint. And that's what this there exists b is. So if you have that, um, 
there exists B such that PAB entails Q of A, uh, then uh, this is equivalent to uh, P of AB entails Q star of AB, this weakened version of Q. So <clears throat> this might look confusing at first, um, but let's just take some examples. So let, let P, Preston? yep. yep. Um, so th just to be clear, when I think about it in this way, it seems like now we're dealing with subsets rather than um, entailment for the, uh, for the order relation. Why? Uh, What's the difference? I guess I, I think of um, I think of these predicates as a subset of A, and then you're talking about subobjects. Sorry, subobjects, not subsets. Yeah. You can think of a predicate as a statement, like Q of A. Well, if Christian gives an example, he could run it through in both the subset way or the statement yeah. way. Yeah, so, so it's interchangeable. And uh, just for the sake of writing this, I, I, I'm writing it in terms of the predicates. Um, so for example, we can take P of AB to be, um, to be A times B equals one. Let's say A and B are both just the real numbers. And this predicate is the statement A times B equals one. And then when you quantify over it, you're saying there exists a B such that A times B equals one. So you're just saying A is some unit. Uh, and we can take Q to be uh, A is non-zero. So this implication is if uh, A is a unit, then A is non-zero. And this is equivalent <coughs> to uh, if A times B is one, then A is non-zero and B equals B. The point is that since we, um, we were just saying there exists some B, and then we had an implication out of that, uh, the point is that this, this predicate that we were concluding with must not have really depended on B and it must have been true uh, no matter what B is. So uh, just to help make this a little more clear. Uh, so let's say- one, one thing that you might do, the P and Q depending on a, A can be anything. So it's useful to consider the case where A is terminal, right? There exists B such that P of B implies Q, where Q is just some truth value. That's, that's a, a somewhat degenerate case, but closer to the, uh, the propositional logic you were just looking at. Um, why, why do I want to do that? Uh, as an example, you mean? <clears throat> yeah, just as an example. Oh, uh, I yeah, I already have a simple example in mind that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's say. I guess one one reason to do that is that um, if you think of Q as Z from the uh, the propositional logic example then the exists b dot p of b is really the summing over all the b's. And so it's just a, a closer um, analogy to the, the propositional logic. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, if we, if we take we have this, uh, this predicate that two numbers multiply to one. And then 
we can quantify over it and get a predicate that only depends on A. Um, so uh, we would write this as there exists B such that A times B equals one. Uh, this is just saying A is a unit. Um, and similarly, we can take uh, a predicate on just A and make it vacuously depend on B. So A is non-zero and B equals B. And what we're, what we're getting is that um, part of the reason why that equivalence might have looked confusing is that um, is that there's really an implicit for all here. Um, so when we were looking at predicates on A, we have this um, implicit for all A. Uh, for all A, this predicate evaluating to true implies this predicate evaluating to true. And over here, we still have it, but now we've also pulled out the, the B. Q star A B. So, so uh, we can see this as directly generalizing this thing we were talking about before with disjunction. So before, here we were looking at, um, we were looking at something or something else. Um, now we're getting uh, a big disjunction of P, A, comma, something, and B. We're getting a big or of all of those. And then we are homming out of it or, or entailing out of it. And uh, in the same way that we had this, this split into an and, Here, when we pull out this existential, it's becoming a, a for all, which is like this, a big and. Um, so, so in our example, this was saying, uh, there exists a B such that AB equals one, implies A is non-zero. So A is a unit implies A is non-zero. And this reasoning is equivalent to uh, for all B, basically it doesn't matter what B is, as long as AB equals one, then, uh, then it must have been the case that A was non-zero and B could have been whatever. So the reasoning didn't depend on what B was. Uh, let me just pause there and take some questions and make sure everybody's following. Alex, Joe, Joe, Jade, any uh, thoughts or questions? Yeah, some folks should probably try to ask questions. I, I don't know. Oh. So, I haven't seen this particular presentation of um, quantifiers as adjoints. The, the typical one that I've seen involves um, the, given a morphism, there's, sorry, given a function, there's the pre-image on subsets of the sets. Yeah, we're about to and, get to that. 
Oh, okay. Great. Yeah, so this is the special case where we're doing projection. And uh, the quantification that people do every day is usually in relation to this weakening. Uh, but then we have this further generalization that we can actually do it for any function. Yeah, and in that case, the, the function is the trivial one. Mm -hmm. um, a question I had, if I didn't see the, uh, the universal quantification at the beginning, I would have assumed that A is a constant. Is that right? Or sounds like that's wrong? Um, no, yeah, I mean, when we want to describe a relationship between predicates uh, and we want to use the variables. We need we need this for all there, because these okay. are truth values, and we want to say. In general, you know, if if you're starting to introduce predicates into a situation, the those variables need to be defined. They need to be quantified. So that this makes sense. I was just leaving it out of the slide because having that for all there might look confusing when we're defining there. So. Yeah, I, I think most, I don't know, most logicians don't feel the need to put that for all there. So then, then the, uh, if you leave of those for alls out, then you have uh, things that are predicates, that is things that depend on it the value of the guy lowercase a and are either true or false. And, and then you're asserting that the predicate on top, the stuff in the big fat parentheses is equivalent true if and only if the predicate on the bottom is true. Yeah. So in fact, some logicians get upset if you try to clarify the situation by sticking in a for all <laughs> uh, in this way, because then, I mean, it's still, it's, uh, yeah, in fact, yeah, yeah, in fact, I am now upset <laughs> too, because um, it's, I think it's better to leave them out and just say that the stuff on top without the for all is true, if and only if the stuff on the bottom is true, um, but I think that kind of obscures this pulling out here. Um, is I, I think that's the main reason why this, this way of writing it could look confusing. Because uh, it's, it's not clear what's happening to the B as you go from I, but I, I understand that like logicians would be totally used to this, um, but just for the, the lay person. Okay, yeah. Probably everything is confusing, <laughs> confusing yeah. at first, no matter what you do. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, so um, so this is giving us, uh, this is our, this is our weekend, uh, our weekend predicate, and we're showing that this is a left adjoint to that process. So we're getting, um, now we're talking about the, the power sets of, of A and A times B. We had one functor uh, going from, uh, from power set A to power set A times B that was weakening, and we found a left adjoint that was going the other way. And then similarly, uh, universal quantification is the right adjoint to this. And everything's just exactly dual. So here, if we took, if we took uh, Q to be A equals 0, and then P was A times B equals 0, then um, we can see how we have this reasoning that if A is zero, then uh, for all things you multiply with it, uh, A times B is always gonna be zero. And that's equivalent to um, if A is zero and B is whatever, then A times B is zero. So 
So questions about that? Now we're talking about um, multiplying to zero mm -hmm. um, would, and, and that's kind of dual to uh, multiplying to one, is that? Yeah, that that's just the example that I- Or you of. just chose that example, it wasn't. It, it could be anything. Just, just okay, what I okay. thought of, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's some nice thing to say there where I was kind of taking the negation of this situation to get this one, um, but I haven't formalized it. There, there's probably some some way to take predicates like this and negate them and get a predicates like this. Yeah, thanks. Anything else? So. So this talk is cool because it starts with really fundamental stuff and then it proceeds to get more and more general. Um, so this is the existential and universal quantification that, that people do every day. Uh, but what is less known is that whereas this reasoning was using the function pi to involve uh, changing from like changing one predicate to another, we can actually do this for any function. So <clears throat> given just some function f from x to y, uh, we can quantify over it essentially. Uh, and what that means is that, um, is that in the same way that we were pulling back along pi to weaken one predicate to another, we can pull back along any morphism. And that functor uh, still has left and right adjoints. So uh, this first one is actually very familiar. So we're defining exists of, of u uh, to be all y such that there exists an x uh, so that f of x equals y and x equal uh, x is in u. So this is a very convoluted way of describing what, what subset of y. Someone has got to answer that. We're all getting an f. <laughs> you have to try to answer it. You don't have to be correct. I know what it is, but I'm not saying. Is this f of u? Yeah. Yeah, this is what uh, most mathematicians would just call f of u. And we just kind of take for granted uh, the fact that uh, functions are not only defined on elements, but defined on subsets. Wow. Say the word image, please, somebody. Image. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so people would normally just call this image. Uh, if you want to be more formal, you would call it direct image. But yeah, this is something mathematicians just take for granted every day. Um, but the fact that, uh, yeah, so it's probably underappreciated that this is actually a left adjoint and even more um, more unknown is that um, pre-image also has a right adjoint. There's another canonical way to take a subset of X and make it into a subset of Y that is not just normal direct image. And actually, I haven't even found a standard term for it uh, yet. Uh, I've just been calling it saturated image. Um, but there's probably something catchy out there. So what it is, is universal of view is all y such that, uh, it's, it's y such that for all x, f of x equals y implies that x is in u. So this is all y whose pre-image is contained in u. 
Um, so normally with direct image, excuse me, if you take the image of some subset and then you take its pre-image, it could get a lot bigger. You know, there could be lots of other stuff outside of you that also mapped into f of u. But so, so sometimes you might care about uh, the subset of the image uh, whose pre-image is completely contained in you. It's like some kind of security property where you're getting the stuff that could have only come from you. Can I quiz people on, on this concept? Yeah. Maybe I won't make people do the quiz now. So one question is, is that guy for all f u always a subset of the guy there exists f u? Or not? This is just a fiendish question to see if you really intuit these two concepts. Do you know the answer to that one, Christian? I'm just curious. Yes, uh -huh. I know the answer. Okay, you had a poker face there, so I couldn't tell. <laughs> so I'll, I'll give you a, a I'll say something and then let people ponder it. So it looks like for all f u is contained and there exists f u because there exists uh, you're in there exists f u u being y y is in there exists f u if there's somebody that maps to it that's in u. Whereas it's in for all f u if everybody that maps to it is in u. Now I'm trying to, I'm being very sneaky here. So you shouldn't trust what I'm saying, but it, but that's a plausibility argument that for all f u is contained in, in there exists f u. And I think I'll leave it at that and let you ponder it. <laughs> it's a digression, sorry. Okay, we can, we can ponder it. So, um, so we're getting a generalization of the previous generalization. Uh, now this was pi before, and it was inducing this thing called weakening, where predicates of a times b became, sorry, predicates of a became predicates of a times b, and that had left and right adjoints. Now we're getting it for any function. And um, this is kind of the canonical example of something called a hyperdoctrine. Uh, that I know Bias has, has written about and uh, me and Aaron are getting very interested in. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, we always get these triple adjoints and I just wanted to run through the proof. Uh, I was, um, I was talking about this with that reading group, uh, talking about the proof and we were talking about it in kind of an informal way um, where it just, you know, this is something where intuitively you can get through it, the proof, and it's no problem. But it's such a fundamental fact that I wanted to find a canonical proof. And it came from thinking about, this is overkill, I know, but it came from thinking about uh, sets as categories enriched in truth values. And then this is actually, uh, so, so we can think of the uh, u as a predicate from x to 2, and v as a, as a predicate from x to 2. And these would be proposition enriched functors. And then these two are special examples of um, left and right con extension. And so this there exists would be a co-end. This would be a hom. This is tensor. And then this is the end and the hom and a power. So you don't need to know about that. It was, it's just uh, how I got this proof. So suppose that, uh, 
So we're starting with the left adjoint. So we're supposing exists of U is a subset of V. Then that just means uh, for all Y, if Y is in exists of U, then it's in V. Then we expand out the definition of exists of U. And here's the tricky part. We want to pull out this there exists. Um, and we need to take into account this fact that this is like we're getting that some predicate that's that's parameterized by f. And so uh, this looks complicated, but all that it's saying is that uh, now we're quantifying over that the there exists x flips to a for all in the same way that we've been seeing before. And this is just saying, okay, give me all y and all x, all, all pairs, if uh, y is the image of x, then if x was in u, then y is in v. This is just another way of saying that f of u is contained in v. Um, and then we're just flipping these variables, and then we're using a specific case of the Yoneda lemma where if, if we were starting on the premise that f of x equals y, then here we could just substitute uh, f of x for y and so and eliminate the dependence on y. And so we get that for all x, if x is in u, then f of x is in v. And so that's the same thing as saying that um, u is contained in the pre-image of v. So, of course, there are there are simpler proofs, but I just enjoy the process of finding uh, a proof that's canonical. Any questions? So one benefit of this proof is that it dualizes uh, exactly. Um, so you get the same the same kind of reasoning. If V is contained in universal of U, this one is weirder. We're, we're not as used to thinking about this saturated image, but we can expand out the definition in the same way. And now you get a similar thing where now we're homming into a for all. And so we that for all is gonna pop out here. And then you're gonna get the same implication that, that if uh, f of x, that y is the image of x, then x is in u. Um, so, <clears throat> so now we're just talking about the opposite thing, where before it was something very familiar. We were saying if x is in u, then uh, f of x was in v. That's just talking about direct image. Now it's the slightly less obvious thing going the other way, where if y is in v, then x must have come from u. Um, but that's what this, this dual formula is, is taking care of. And then you do the same thing where you flip the variables and then you just substitute, since so you're starting with f of x equals y, you substitute that in. And now we're getting that, that the pre-image of v is contained in u. Which answers John's puzzle as well. Yeah. The, the lack of an equal sign there is. Any, uh, any questions? Yeah, so we're getting, we're getting this triple adjoint for any function now. So you can view this as uh, generalizing the quantification that we do every day, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. All right, so, so the last step of the generalization is, um, is important and kind of takes it into a bigger world. So we were talking about subsets and predicates, and from those we were getting a, a pre-order. Um, so in general, um, 
So we could think about why the subobjects of Y are the monic morphisms into Y. So we can think about these as parts of Y or, you know, things looking into Y that respect the distinctions of Y or the subtleties of Y. So Y appreciates uh, its subobjects because it's because they're a part of them. But in general, Y just wants to be seen by anything. And so in general, a generalized element is just anything looking into Y. So any function uh, induces a pre-image equivalence relation, which partitions the domain. This is just a really basic fact in math that we use all the time. Uh, so if you have u going from a to y, uh, you can understand that function as a y-indexed family of fibers. So when people say fiber, they mean the pre-image of some element, usually. So, so you can think of a as being a sum of uh, these fibers um, that are each the pre-image uh, over elements of Y. And um, in the case where we're just talking about sets, we have that uh, any set is actually the, the co-product of the fibers. Uh, but just as some foreshadowing, we could also consider the product of these fibers. We could just do this formal like dualization of that object uh, because this also uh, naturally sits over Y by projection. And it also has a really nice um, interpretation as a set of sections or right inverses of uh, this function U. Um, oh, whoops, I called it F inside, but yeah. Uh, this function u. Um, <clears throat> the reason why is because uh, when we think about this index product, uh, elements of it uh, are specified by first you give me an element of y, you give me some y coordinate, uh, and then you pick uh, an element of the fiber. So you can understand this as kind of like a dependent function uh, whose codomain uh, depends on which y you plug in. It's like a branching version of a function uh, that could go to any fiber um, of this of this function of you. Of you. Um, and this gives a section because if you uh, each time you plug in some Y and you choose something in its fiber, of course, if you post compose with the function U, you're going to land back on that same, same Y that you started with. And anyways, this, <clears throat> this is important because th the main insight that, uh, ties this, this generalization together is that so far we've been talking about um, existential quantification as indexed sum and universal quantification as indexed product of some kind. And so this important lesson from arithmetic is that um, products are basically like index sums in many contexts and exponents are like index products. And uh, indexing is, is what is providing this uh, hierarchy of these, these fundamental operations. And so the reason why this is gonna be nice is that the, these generalized quantifications that we're leading up to end up being equivalent to a certain nice kind of Cartesian closed structure on uh, these categories of generalized 
elements. Um, but I'm probably not going to have time to get too deep into it. But um, so I'll just pause for a second. Um, questions about this. If we look at indexed as repeated, then that lesson is how we originally learned what products and exponents were in grade school. Yeah, exactly. And then there's the question of why we stop here and not go on any further. Yeah. Yeah. There's some reason. <laughs> um, no questions? Okay. I'm hoping everybody's here. Okay. So. Well, I guess I've got a question mm -hmm. for later, which is why are products and co-products the things that we focus on? Why, why not tetration? Why isn't there a, a nice categorical meaning to tetration or um, if we want to stick to the commutative ones, the, the operation in um, Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Yeah, yeah, we can we can save that for later. But I I, I do believe there is some fundamental reason. Uh, there there's something different about exponent. Uh, I mean, it has it becomes a hom, and there becomes a a mix of variance, and um, I don't think it's just some sort of coincidence or, or contingency that we just stopped at exponent um, or a coincidence that, you know, relationships in nature uh, generally stop at exponent and don't go on to, uh, to higher stuff. But uh, yeah, I guess we can save that toward, toward the end. Uh, okay, so, <clears throat> so these generalized elements are just anything looking into some fixed object. And uh, here now with this generalization of subset, um, we get not just a pre-order, but a category that's called the slice category over Y, written set sli uh, slash Y, um, where the objects are morphisms into Y, functions in, uh, into Y, and uh, morphisms are commuting triangles. <clears throat> so the way to think about this is basically the world relative to Y. Um, so to make this formal, you could consider Y as the set of <clears throat> types in some universe of discourse. Uh, in some area of math, you have the, the general types of things that you care about. And any time that you talk about things, they need to be typed uh, relative to that to that set of types. You can't just say x. You you always need to be saying you know x is a real number. And so here, we can view uh, a generalized element of y <clears throat> as a typing context, where uh, we interpret uh, you know the image of some element. A being uh, some element Y as A has type Y. So sitting inside of here, there could be, you know, the type of real numbers, the type of natural numbers, etc. And the fibers over each one would be all of the terms of that type. Um, this stuff is the beginning of Y type theorists care so much about, uh, about these kind of categories. Um, so, so yeah, in this interpretation, generalized elements of Y are Y-typed contexts, and then morphisms are changes in context that have, uh, the fact that this diagram has to commute means that things have to respect the typing. If X was a real number, 
over here, it can't suddenly become something else. K of x needs to still be a real number. You can have operations that uh, take things of certain types and make something of a different type, but the changes of context respect the types. Any questions? Hi, Christian. Can you can you say one more time um, about what a context is? Or yeah, uh, it basically just means like uh, your current knowledge. You're in, you're in some process of reasoning, and um, it's it's your current set of um, facts that you have judged to be true or something. You know that in this function, um, you consider just some simple finite sets. Uh, it would be, okay, right now I know that pi is a real number uh, and I also know that, uh, I don't know, pi is a transcendental number or something. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just looking for a... Often in logic, contexts have to do with the types of lists of variables. So if you say, if I know that X is of type A and Y is of type B, then I know that this term involving X and Y is of type C. But if the types of, the, of X and Y were to change, then the type of T would change. Yeah, so uh, maybe I could just quickly draw it. So let's say, let's say y just consists of, um, you know, natural numbers and transcendental numbers. Keep them disjoint for, uh, for simplicity. Um, and so you have this, uh, this function, maybe let's say you leave the possibility that it's uh, um, something else. But yeah, so the idea is that um, here you have all real numbers and then you're, you're in some reasoning where you're judging uh, Okay, here are the things that I know to be natural numbers, the stuff sitting over n. Uh, here are the things that I know are transcendental. And here are the things that are everything else, basically. And so if you have this context where you say, okay, I figured out that pi is transcendental and I figured out that three was a natural number, Etc. It's just a collection of knowledge in some stage of reasoning. Does that make okay, sense? Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So, <clears throat> so here's, here's where we get this uh, generalization. Um, so, so we could view all the stuff we were saying about subsets or predicates as a certain subcategory of the slice category. It was just uh, where these generalized elements were subobjects or they were monic. Um, but now we're getting a general form for slice categories. So in the same way that a pre-image defined our power set functor uh, as a contravariant functor from sets to posets. Uh, more generally, pullback defines this slicing as a contravariant functor from set to cat by an action known as change of base. So given some function from z to y, we get this diagram where on the right side we have the world relative to y. And um, by pulling back these morphisms along f, 
we're getting uh, a functor to the world relative to z. So, um, you know, if y is representing a set of types, uh, we don't always stay in some fixed universe, and this process is describing how to uh, move between universes. Um, the reason why this can be seen as a direct generalization of pre-image is that if over here one of these generalized elements were monic, pulling back along any function is actually going to uh, compute the pre-image. The, the pullback of, of a monic is still monic, and you'll precisely get um, pairs of, uh, of something in a and something in z such that f of uh, such that f of z equals a uh, thought of as sitting inside of y. So so this pullback is actually generalizing uh, preimage. And um, <clears throat> And then the way that it sits over Z is just by projection, because uh, this is uh, basically a generalization of product. And so we, we get a, a functor that um, these are two objects in sl the slice over Y, and we had some functor between them, uh, and we get uh, there's a there's a clear way to turn that into a morphism between the, the images. So uh, if we use this notation where we thought of a generalized element as a family of fibers indexed by y, then we can understand uh, pullback as basically just uh, re-indexing these fibers. So basically what's going on is that A is like a sum uh, or a union of, of fibers over Y. And then for each element of Y, there is, it also has a fiber in Z. And what we're doing is we're really just copying the fiber over that element uh, to also lie over all of those elements of Z that, that mapped to that element. So there's, there's some other nice picture that I could draw, but running short on time. Hopefully you can picture, you have these, this union of fibers here, and for each one lying over some Y here, there were a bunch of, there could have been a bunch of things in Z mapping to that element, and we're gonna copy it uh, for each one of those elements. And then this is equipped with the projection. So that's what this, this means. Questions? So, so the, this conclusion that we're getting to. So uh, if we do this in the case of set, uh, there is this uh, definition that is a clear generalization of um, what we were doing for, for pre-image, um, except now we're doing a, uh, a sum rather than a, an actual sum rather than there exists and product instead of for all. And essentially, uh, when you work it out, this is just like an indexed version of uh, the universal properties of coproduct and product. Um, so this stuff is all in the Sheaves and Geometry and Logic book. Um, but anyway, the the conclusion that uh, I won't have time to get into, and we can maybe do another time is that this, this generalization is big because it doesn't depend on set. It makes sense 
in any category where the slice categories are nice. So whenever you have a category with pullbacks, you get uh, that slicing is a functor in that way that, that had the nice diagram. Um, and so for any category with pullbacks, um, we, we get this pullback functor between slice categories. And it always has a left adjoint, which is actually just given by post-composition. Uh, but moreover, if the slice categories are Cartesian closed, then we also have a right adjoint. And um, it's, it's basically going back to this thing that I was foreshadowing about um, products are like index sums and exponents are like index products. Um, we can think of pulling back uh, as uh, being a product. If you, have, if you have two morphisms into a terminal object, um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I don't want to I don't want to go on too long, but basically pullback is serving to uh, define a product and the left adjoint just goes back and, and makes it into a product that stays over the same object. Um, so you get one co-monad on the slice over A uh, that gives you a product structure on, on that slice category. And you're going to get an adjoint monad on that slice category that actually gives you a hom, and it's it's given by this uh, right adjoint to pull back. Um, so, yeah, I'm not going to uh, do the proof now, and uh, it's kind of uh, confusing, and I'm still looking for a simpler proof because. Uh, so far, the stuff that I've been finding is not, not very easy to follow. Um, so some other time in the seminar, I, I can talk about this. But, um, but anyways, this stuff is the foundation of dependent type theory, which is a huge thing that type theorists and programmers care about nowadays. And if you hear people talking about dependent sum and dependent product, um, this is what they're talking about, or sum type and pi type. Uh, this is what they're talking about. So anyway, uh, this is in the first chapter of Sheaves and Geometry and Logic. You can also find uh, some about it in Bart Jacob's Categorical Logic and Type Theory, um, and I'm sure many other places. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Kristen. You're welcome. So uh, what questions do you all have or just general thoughts? So where in semi, in something like normal math, do people, could you go back one slide? Uh, yeah. Where do people, where does this right adjoint show up in something like everyday life? Everyday life. Um, well, mathematicians, everyday life. That is, you know, they're, yeah. they're, they're mathematicians do. I'm sure it must. Um, but I don't actually know, so I'm not really quizzing you. I'm... Yeah, so, so um, for the people that are familiar with it in type theory, they call it uh, this a dependent function type. Uh, you can see it as generalizing a normal HOM uh, because if you do this in set, you get that um, that pi forms these dependent homs 
where the codomain depends on what you plug in to the domain. So uh, back when we were talking about uh, this, this idea of the product of the fibers uh, representing a set of sections of some bundle, uh, mm -hmm. the idea is that you, your family of fibers is, can be considered as like a set of possible codomains of this dependent function. And then depending on which uh, element of Y you plug in, it can go to any one of those codomains. So you pick, um, yeah, you pick some Y coordinate and then you pick something in its fiber. So it generalizes the function type basically. Uh, which is why programmers really like it. Um, so if you look in the homotopy type theory book, um, toward the beginning, they give lots of compelling examples. Um, but you can see like universal quantification as a, as an instance of this, because, you know, depending when you say for all X, P of X, uh, for each, uh, for each X that you plug in, you're getting a different predicate. Um, yeah. So. Okay. Sometime you should try to think of a more lowbrow bunch of examples of where this shows up. Mm -hmm. Can I try one? Yeah. What? Can I try one? Sure. I have a bag of groceries <laughs> and it has fruit in it and it has bread in it. And then I have a recipe, but the recipe says if I pull out a fruit, it will tell me how to make a cake. And if I pull out bread, it will tell me how to make a sandwich. So that would be a dependent function type. It, it doesn't, it's codomain isn't one type, but depending on what I apply it to, it gives me something of either the type cake or of the type sandwich. What's that example? What is that an example of mathematically? What in sounds like you're talking about a section of a bundle there or yeah. something. How is that an example of what I was asking for? In the case of sets, in the case where you do this with sets, you get. I'm set. perfectly happy with sets. So it's this right. So what was your F there, Aaron? Um. Sorry, uh, let me try to see this notation. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not so familiar with this stuff about slice categories. I was just thinking of a, a dependent um, dependent function. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm asking for an example of this right adjoint. So this right adjoint is a way to take a set over A and turn it into a set over B when you have a function from F, F from A to B. The left adjoint is something we know about all the time if you, because it's just post composition. If I have a, a set with a map to A and compose it with F and get a set with a map to B. So that's the left adjoint and that's why Christian said it always exists. It's nothing fancy about it. Um, but there's this other thing down at the bottom line here and I was asking for an example of that other thing. So it's a, another way to <laughs> take a set over A and turn it into a set over B, given this function. So, okay, anyway. So I, I, you, you've I got think, a I think the right adjoint turns up in dynamically typed languages. So in JavaScript, I could write something like, 
function f of x return um, quote hello or sorry if x equals zero return quote hello else return five so if x is zero you get a string and if x is anything else you get a number mm -hmm. and so by taking the product over all of these different values you have for each value a type that it returns and so it's like a big list or product of of types over all of the different values you could pass in i'm still not seeing a function from a to b and how you're using <coughs> turn a set over a into a set over b which is what this yeah i mean on the spot that's not easy but okay well, well, well you should I'll figure it out probably something that for you and send you a note yeah. sorry oh i just said i will try to uh, convert my example to that language i'm, I'm um, not exactly sure how to do it here but i'll send you a note okay yeah i, I do understand cartesian local cartesian closedness sort of on its own terms as every slice category being cartesian closed i mean i could spiel i could describe examples of how that works and why it's good for something uh, but this other way of thinking about it i just hadn't thought of which is my deficiency in understanding the <laughs> this uh this stuff i it sounds incredibly important uh, so there should be like some there should be examples running around all over the place mm -hmm. okay anyway that's just my request for deeper uh, request for some other way to understand what's going on there. Any other questions?